see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with Sam Beckman. Uh, thanks, Sam, for joining me once again for this dialogue. Thank you for suffering me once again. <laughs> Little deprecation there, self-deprecation. Um, uh, so it's false, false modesty. False modesty. <laughs> so uh, Sam, uh, you write and uh, speak about narcissism and psychopathy, just in, and uh, you write articles, books. Um, you've done some, uh, you know, videos. You have a website on narcissism and psychopathy. You've got a book called. Uh, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and you were featured in a documentary, I, Psychopath, and you were kind of like the star of that. And um, the, you know, we've done a couple interviews, two interviews so far, and what I uh, want to do in, in this, um, in this here is to actually have a dialogue with you. And what we've been doing is something called uh, Empathy Circles, and it's using uh, the Carl Rogers approach to empathic listening, where Carl Rogers would, I don't know if you're probably familiar with, well, familiar with Carl Rogers, he was a famous uh, psychiatrist um, uh, in the United States, and he would use an empathic listening approach with, uh, with his you know, clients, as he would call them. Yeah. And uh, he would do like reflective empathic listening with them and I thought it would be interesting if you and I would have a dialogue uh, around what our needs are for empathy and use the empathic listening uh, approach in that uh, as you say something, you know, you, you want to, you can share whatever is, you know, coming up for you and I will reflect it to the best of my abilities to hear, really hear until you feel satisfied that I'm hearing what you say. And then I'll respond or share something, and you can reflect until I feel fully heard. And I was just, because I'm just wondering, like you're saying, you're a, a narcissist with psychopathic tendencies. I'm just wondering what the effect will be, what the experience will be if we have this mutual empathic listening approach. Um, so, does that sound uh, doable for you? I will, I will gladly submit myself to being mirrored and reflected and, and so on. Uh, okay. I think, I think I might find it a bit difficult to apply the same to you. And oh, I, uh, we, we, the, the previous two encounters between us haven't been interviews in the classical sense. They will be stretching the word too thin. They have been uh, dialogues, actually. The second one has been a dialogue, the first one has been a furious debate, but they've both been interactive and, you know, we, we equally contributed to both. Um, in this one, the third one, you are asking me to deploy an asset which I do not possess. I, I may be able to reflect back at you syntactical and grammatical structures. I may be able to take your words and recombine them so as to elicit from you emotional and other reactions, but I think in the absence of true empathy, in the absence of the emotional component and correlate, uh, it won't work. Okay, so I'm hearing that you're willing to give it a try and that in our first interviews that we did, well, the first... There's a major delay in, in some. Yeah, there's a major know. delay, so we're going to have to give it a lot of uh, space between, uh, between speaking. Because you're, you're in Macedonia, and I'm in California, and there's low bandwidth there in Macedonia. So just to give anyone an understanding of why the, there's such a lag with the audio. So you're saying that in our first, we've had two calls. The first one uh, was more of a debate, you felt, and the second one was just a real dialogue. And that you're willing to give this a try, but you're feeling that you might be able to syntactically reflect what I'm saying but you won't have the kind of the, the real emotional kind of reflection is, is what I was kind of hearing. So, um, yeah, just to continue, I thought we would just talk about what our needs are for empathy. Uh, or we can talk about whatever comes up. 
uh, for you if there is uh... yeah. why don't we, why don't we discuss the word empathy and um, you we mentioned in our first uh, interview turn confrontation that was the first one <laughs> second one was much better but we mentioned the first one that empathy is an English rendering of Einfühlen, the German word, uh, which is precise to some extent. And we also mentioned that Einfühlen in German had to do with the appreciation of art, with the aesthetics of art, with the ability of the spectator to project himself into the frame of mind of the artist. And so, but the word empathy itself, the etymology of the word, comes from Greek, not from German. And empathy is a combination of two, of a, of a uh, prefix and a word in Greek. And the word is pathea, which in Greek means um, to emote, to feel. But it also means to suffer, to be in great pain, to be tortured. <laughs> So empathy means the ability to, to commiserate, the ability to experience other people's negative emotions, suffering, torture, pain, at least etymologically. Of course, since then, the word has developed to engulf other emotions, including positive emotions. But it's telling that the etymological source of the word has to do with the negativity in life. With, with the ordeal um, of life, you know, with the, with the hell that life is. <laughs> okay, so you're wanting to first, uh, before we kind of do this, get into the dialogue, you're wanting to look at what the word empathy means, and you're referring to the etymology of it, uh, you're, you know, from the German Einfühlung, that uh, the word was... Uh, Brought into English as empathy, and it's based on the uh, on the uh, on the Greek, and it's uh, dealing with uh, commiserating together, uh, uh, relating to um, uh, empathy. Empathy, I guess, is uh, I'm not what, what quite sure what that. It's a uh, feeling. So you're you're seeing. So you're, if you're if the etymology is not necessarily how the word is actually used. Uh, now, but you're just saying that it's important to look at what the meaning, the original meaning of the word is. Yes, because because there is a choice of words. There is a choice of words in Greek. The people who invented the word empathy in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, and brought it into, imported it into English, they could have chosen another word. They didn't have to choose the word pathea, which is essentially a very negative word. Oh. Pathea in, in Greek means mainly suffering, torture, and not durable. And so, and so the people who, who, who and signifies pain and suffering and torture, it's a very curious that that, that um, denotes uh, love. You know, to, why didn't they coin a word which means to to feel the love of another person? Why did they that, why did they coin a word that says to feel the suffering of another person? So it's it, I think it would explain why narcissists, for instance, lack empathy. If empathy is about resonating with someone else's pain, narcissists can't do that. Because they are the products of pain. Narcissists are, are the very sad outcomes of abuse, mainly in childhood, but not only in childhood, by parents, peers, role models. So they are the residue of pain. It's very difficult. They have engulfed themselves, they have encased themselves in a narcissistic defense precisely in order not to feel pain. So narcissist, narcissism is about being immune to pain. Normally, <laughs> narcissists would not like to experience someone else's pain. Or, to translate it from Greek, they would not like to be empathic. Mm. So, it's an interesting path, in my view. Uh -huh. Psychology leads us to psychopathology. 
Uh, so you're really looking at the uh, word empathy, saying that it's, it's about dealing, uh, being aware of pain, and that uh, narcissists, uh, they've maybe through childhood, they've kind of like uh, um, suppressed the pain or they don't want to feel the pain. And it's, narcissism is about, you know, suppressing pain. So, and that's what's kind of inhibiting the empathy because they just don't want to feel their own pain or the pain of others either. Yes, they are. They're pain averse. Exactly. Pain averse. They're pain averse. And mm. being empathic, being empathic means also feeling other people's pain, sharing in their pain, sharing in their predicament, existential predicament. And narcissists don't want that. They have, narcissists invented the false self. Narcissists invent these defense mechanism, complicated perimeter fences, fending off pain, because as children they've been exposed to tremendous, unendurable amount, amounts of pain and agony. And so they, they, they have developed this shell, this, you know, cocoon, which isolates them from the environment, especially the human environment. Humans are sources of pain. Humans are like beacons of pain. And <laughs> they, are, they are averse. To humans because they are averse to pain, therefore they are not empathic. And, and the Greeks root of the word empathy seems to indicate that because empathia in Greek means to commiserate, to share someone's suffering and pain and torture. Uh, so you're saying that the root of uh, the word itself, kind of the etymology, etymological root of empathy is the Greek and it's about sharing other people's pain. So you kind of translate to the current where people don't want to feel other people's, I mean, narcissists don't want to feel other people's pain because they've kind of cocooned themselves uh, off from that pain and they don't want to feel their own pain and they don't want to feel the pain of others. So there's like a block to uh, empathy there. And you see, and you see, throughout history, you see that when, when pain was at its height, when pain ruled, like in the 14th century during the Black Death, and in the 20th century during the Second World War and the Holocaust, and you know when pain was king, you see an an increase in narcissistic behaviors, narcissistic defenses, and narcissistic traits. You see a rise in narcissism. And I think a rise in global narcissism is a reaction to being overwhelmed with pain, societal pain, individual pain. You know, take modern, modern men. Families are crumbling. S social safety networks are nowhere to be found. Terrorism, AIDS. I mean, it's a, it's a pain, it's a pain infused and pain suffused environment. And so I think we are becoming more and more narcissistic. We are retreating and withdrawing and isolating ourselves and society is being utilized because we are trying to avoid pain. It is maybe precise because we are empathic that we turn off our empathy. Ah. It's like, you know, the volume, volume is too high. The volume is too high, you know, it's, there's too much input coming in, you know. You open your television, you open television and see starving people here, people blown to bits and pieces there, you know, it's, and there's just too much of it. It's uh, an overload of, of pain, and a pain fatigue, if you wish. And I think we are learning as, a, as individuals in, in this mass communication society, we're learning to turn off our empathy. So, and, and so we are becoming narcissists, mm -hmm. in effect. So what, you're, what I'm hearing you say, uh, Sam, is that uh, society is so full of pain, and during wars, there's you know there was a lot of pain, and that there's a correlation with uh, narcissism because narcissism is about turning off uh, that pain because it just becomes too overwhelming. So in war, there's yeah. a huge amount of pain, so people become you know shut down. It's, uh, it's almost like an avoidance then. You're kind of like avoiding pain. You don't want to empathize with yeah. others because you, uh, you know, feel that pain. It just becomes too much. And in fact, that maybe people who are narcissistic are actually very empathic, but that they just can't deal with that constant stimulus of, of pain. 
And so that they start shutting down and go into this narcissism. But actually, underneath that might be a, a deep uh, sense of empathy. I mean, it's being you're, the narcissist is trying to shut down. Yes, exactly what you said. I do think, and that's one of the tenets of my work on, on narcissism, where where I made what I consider to be an original contribution. Because a lot of what I do is the rehash. But where I made an original contribution, I think, is where when I suggested that actually narcissists are highly empathic people. And it's what I call cold empathy. What they have done, they have turned off, they turned off the emotional resonance of that empathy. They turned off the emotional component of the empathy. They turned off they turned off the video. They're left only with the audio, if you wish. Mm -hmm. So they have the cold empathy. In other words, they have the ability to identify with other people, to put themselves in other people's shoes, to read other people's body language and, and so on and so forth. But they don't have the emotions that usually go with them because they turn them off. And they learn to turn off these emotions because when these emotions were on, when they were children, it was painful. It was a painful experience. They were surrounded with abusive adults and they were subjected to recurrent trauma and recurrent abuse. And they learned that if you want to survive, it was a survival instinct, survival mechanism. They learned that if, you, if they want to survive, if they want to avoid becoming suicidal, for instance, they have to turn off the emotions. And so they were left with a kernel of empathy, which I call cold empathy, but there is no envelope of emotions, and there, are, there is no emotional reaction to their perception of the other. But I disagree completely with current uh, so-called knowledge or current textbooks, which say that narcissists don't have empathy. Because if the narcissist doesn't have empathy, how can, how can the narcissist manipulate other people? To manipulate other people, to exploit them, you need to read them well. You need to understand human psychology. You need to resonate with, with your victims, you know? And so, it's exactly what you said. Narcissists used to have full-scale, full-fledged empathy, and then they turned off the war of empathy. They turned off the emotions because they were too painful. Uh -huh. So you're saying that the narcissists actually do have uh, empathy. They were maybe growing up very empathic and they just couldn't deal with the pain. So they kind of shut that down and they can still kind of read people, uh, but there's no kind of emotional effect. They kind of read people for getting uh, maybe uh, getting something from them, but um, it's a cold empathy. It's it's without the kind of the emotional warmth or emotional feelings that are within that. Exactly why 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 I say that narcissists are a form of robotic artificial intelligence, because in laboratories all over the world today, machines devices are being developed. Some of them robots, some of them not robots, some of them in sophisticated cameras that can read social cues, body language and even emotions, you know. So these machines have called empathy. They can, they, they, in the future, and not too far future, like 10 years from now, you will have a camera on your, on your, in your laptop, and that camera will be able to identify when you're sad, when you're happy, when you're, you know. So that, the camera would have the rudiments of empathy. It would, it would have called empathy. But of course, the camera is not, is not, not going to have emotions. It's the same with the narcissist. Narcissists turn off their emotions because the adults around them abused their empathy. The adults around them tormented, tortured them, traumatized them repeatedly, time and again, day after day, hour after hour. It became too much. The circuits were overburdened. The circuits were overwhelmed. And so the empathy circuit in the narcissist's brain was short-circuited, <laughs> and what's left is the hardware, but not the software. Mm -hmm. So you're using kind of the metaphor of machines, that machines can kind of read uh, kind of the cold empathy, but not the feelings of it, and it's the same thing with the narcissist, that they were kind of emotionally abused kind of growing up, uh, and then they kind of shut down that uh, emotional part of, uh, of the uh, empathy and just left uh, kind of the mechanistic uh, uh, cold empathy. Yeah, yeah. The, the, emo the empathic circuitry. 
Oh, the empathic like circuit. Surge. Well, one thing with the it's like a surge. Oh, surge. With with the yeah. uh, empathic listening, is that I'm going to just keep listening to you until you feel fully heard. Once you feel fully heard, you can just let me know, and then I will share something of myself and have see. If, oh, sorry, if I'm you, not, I'm not aware of the protocol. <laughs> Well, I'm just uh, sharing that with you. So whenever you feel ready, that you feel satisfied to have been heard, there's some things I would like to share, too. Uh, I definitely, I'm definitely heard and overheard. Overheard, <laughs> <laughs> overheard. Okay. So what comes to mind is um, I have a friend who, uh, she, her mother was very much a narcissist, and she's very sensitive to narcissism. And we were doing one of these empathy circles, uh, you know, with reflective listening. And then she was kind of dealing with that narcissism. She was afraid that she was narcissistic because her mother was so narcissistic. And then I said, well, let me play the narcissist. I will become the narcissist. I will take on the role of your narcissism and we'll have a dialogue as your. So if you would reflect what you're hearing so far. You describe a situation where one of your acquaintances or, or friends uh, was exposed to narcissism, and you suggested to put yourself in, to make yourself available as a stand-in for, for the narcissist in their life, and, and to see whether this can elicit reactions or a dynamic which might be beneficial to it, if I understood correctly. That's it, exactly. And I started, we started doing a dialogue, and I acted as her narcissist, you know, and I got into a state of mind where it was so, so enjoyable to only have her empathize with me. It's like when she empathized with me, it's like it felt good. It was like, oh, this is so good. I'm totally in my own head, in my own world. And this person is empathizing with me. And it was like, oh, then I'm interested in you. I'm not like I'm not interested in you unless you're empathizing with me. And so it was, Sweet. and it was so interesting. It was such such an interesting. It was almost like, wow, this is. It feels really good to have people empathize with me, and I'm, and I I'm only interested in her as long as she's empathizing with my state of being and moving me forward in my self-absorption. So when you when you emulated or simulated a narcissist, when you put yourself in the shoes of a narcissist, when you try actually to empathize with a narcissist, you discover that the experience is gradually becoming kind of addictive because <laughs> you discover that it's great, it's very gratifying to be, first of all, the, the center of attention, but more importantly, it's very gratifying for her to provide you with empathy that you could consume and that, that you did not have to reciprocate. That's it, exactly. That, it, it, was, it was such an insight for me. And the other thing is, is uh, growing up, uh, I would say uh, my mother has some of those narcissistic uh, tendencies in that she will talk and talk and talk but she just doesn't give any space to anyone else to talk. And she went through a lot of trauma, you know, World War II, you know, just really terrible things in Germany and, you know, nervous breakdowns and all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I kind of have like a sense of feeling compassion for what she went through. And, and uh, so I can, but I mean, it, it's hard as you're, if you're growing up and you're not being heard, you're not being seen and the person is only, just you know sharing where they are and they don't have space and time for you it's uh it's very difficult so as you were growing up you were actually exposed to someone who who has i, I don't know if she's still alive but yeah who she has, is. Uh, uh -huh. she's a, well at least has so as you were growing up you were exposed to someone who has uh, at the very least narcissistic uh, traits or behaviors and it was um, a very um, difficult experience because you felt that you were not being seen, that you were not being heard, that you're not being validated in effect. Or exactly, empowered. yeah. 
that you serve that you serve merely as a foil, as a kind of pro pro projection screen and and a sounding board for for your mother in this case. However, equally, you felt pity. You felt you felt you empathized with her. You you took into account um, emotionally where she came from, her very traumatic past, the difficult experiences she went through in her life, and so on and so forth. So while you feel that you were not being validated and that's not a very nice experience, you still were able, a part of you was still able to understand her, if not to justify it. Yeah, it's more now I understand. You know, now oh, right. in time, so, as, as time has gone on, I kind of understand right. it more. Um, so they're not they're not simultaneous experiences. Yeah. When you were when you were when you were an adolescent or a child, you felt only the negative aspects, and but now you are more understanding. Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so that's the need yeah. for empathy. I think you know, for my own personal development, my need for empathy would have been to have ha heard more. You know, to have been seen and heard more fully. I think it would have helped my personal development, uh, you know, growing up. My, so we're, I was kind of asking about our needs for em personal needs for empathy, and I think that's one of the needs for empathy that I had was having would have liked to have been seen more deeply and heard more deeply, you know, kind of growing up and um, even though I was very uh -huh. yeah, go ahead, sorry. You believe you believe that your preoccupation with empathy is to do with your personal background. It's a, I didn't say obsession, I said preoccupation. It has to do with, uh, with your personal background, since you have, you have uh, lived with and grown up with a very important figure in your life who was not empathic, in the sense that she didn't hear you and she didn't see you uh, as an autonomous individual and with needs and, and emotions and priorities and so on. Since you've gone through this harrowing experience, you believe that your personal background is the reason that you're so interested in, in empathy and, and uh, so on. Yeah, it, it wasn't a harrowing experience. I mean, that's a little inaccurate. Um, and uh, it, I don't know if it, that's my, I'm not sure if it's really why I'm interested in empathy. You know, Carl Rogers, uh, he came from an evangelical Christian background, conservative background. So he talks about, you know, growing up in that environment, your family, your parents love you, you feel the love, but there's things that are kind of suppressed and you're not really deeply heard. And so when he started being heard, it was in, you know, in hearing other people, it was just very uh, fulfilling feeling, something that he hadn't had. So I think it's, I feel more along the lines of Carl Rogers that, you know, come from a loving background and it wasn't harrowing. And, you know, I had a lot of self-independence, but uh, just, you know, feeling empathy, it feels pretty good. So I just really, that's, yeah. Rather than, rather than reflecting you, I would make a comment on what you just said. If you finish um, reflecting, then I'll be complete and then you can move, we can move to you. No, I, I, I still want to relate, I still want to relate to what you have said. Uh, um, as soon as, as soon as you reflect, then um, I will say I'm I'm fully heard, and we'll turn it over to you if that. Right. Just to use the format. Uh, but what I'm about to say has to do with you, so it's still the same protocol. Yeah, that's the same protocol. Is that we just the person speaking speaks until they're fully heard, and then they say I'm fully heard, and then okay. you can say anything you want, and I'll reflect uh, what you have to say. Oh, all right. So do you feel that you're fully heard? Um. Or do you, do you want to There, there was that last piece just about uh, Carl Rogers sure. um, and seeing a similarity. Sure, me... Yeah. Well, you feel some affinity with uh, Carl Rogers. Both of you came from families that you describe as loving families. However, with uh, a lot of suppressed content and suppressed material in, in these things you don't talk about in, this, uh, in these families. So you feel some affinity with him, and you believe that you have come, you sprang forth from a from a similar background. And for him uh, to to discover empathy, both as a recipient and as a giver, was a liberating experience. And you believe that you are undergoing the same kind of a experience of transformation, and and that now that you are deeply into empathy, both as a giver and as a recipient you believe that you're experiencing the same thing that Carl Rogers went through. That's it. I feel fully heard. Thank you, Sam.
<laughs> I, I, just, I just wanted to make a comment uh, about something you have said. I, you said that you, you came from a loving family and almost with the same breath you said that you were not being heard and seen. And I think these are two mutually exclusive propositions. I do not believe that it is possible to be loved without being heard or seen. I think the essence of love and the epitome of love is exactly the ability to discern the other as a, an autonomous entity with needs, with emotions, with wishes, with fears, with priorities, with preferences, with personal history, with, uh, and so on. So, when you, when, for instance, I, I say that I, I love this person, I love my wife, I love this, but I'm aware because of my, that because of my inability to actually see or hear people, I am also incapable of loving them. In any, in any sense of the word. I think people often confuse love with dependence, or they confuse love with provision, with the provision of, of uh, existential essentials, like food and shelter. This is not love. This is a working arrangement. It's a business arrangement, you know. The love entails being seen and heard. There is no love without full-scale empathy. It's not a spectrum. It's like pregnancy. You either are capable of loving or you're not. There, is no, there are no gradations of empathy. You can't be 40% empathic and 26% loving. It's a yes or no, it's a binary state. Mm -hmm. And so when you say that your mother did not hear you and did not see you, or you felt that you were not heard and seen, and therefore did not validate you, I am not sure in which sense you can equally state that she loved you. It's between you and yourself, of course, none of my business, but I'm just commenting on the... I'm perplexed by the juxtaposition of these two statements, because they are incongruous. They don't go together. This is the, the first uh, thing. The second thing is... Well, let me reflect that so I can... Yeah, sure. So what I'm hearing sure. is, I had said, you know, I did have felt uh, not yeah. seen in some cases, and then... Uh, but loved, and you're seeing that as a juxtaposition that you can't um, really, that they don't go together, that it's binary. You're either seen and loved or you're not seen and loved, and there's no kind of gradations between the two. It's either on or off. And so you're just kind of noticing about that, about what I've said, and you see that as kind of, uh, I don't know if it's, uh, Maybe an inconsistency, you're seeing it as maybe an inconsistency or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is an open question why you feel the need to protest and to say that you did come from a loving home and so on. But that's between you and your therapist. I, we are dealing now with, uh, with the issue of empathy, not with your specific psychodynamics. Um, the, second, the second comment I would like to make with regards to what you have said. When I use the word harrowing, which is admittedly a very loaded and very harsh word, when I use the word harrowing, you were quick to, um, maybe not protest, but you were quick to suggest a, a substitute. <laughs> they say it wasn't harrowing, it was, you know, it was this, it was that. But I think that if one grows up in an environment where one is not seen, fully, not hurtfully, and therefore, in my view, at least, not loved. And where, where it's all kind of a secretive, secretive cult-like thing, you know, things that you should never talk about, secrets that are, you know, in the family closet, um, if the past, which is unmentionable. You know, this kind of, this kind of ambience for me, for me, it doesn't oblige you, it may not apply to you. But as far as I'm concerned, this kind of ambience is hiring. I cannot think of something more difficult than not being seen and heard. And I, I cannot think of something more difficult than living in an environment where free speech is curtailed by some kind of 
clandestine occult protocols of what can and cannot be said, taboos, floating taboos as to what can and cannot be said. For me, this is this is a harrowing experience. Mm. But of course, you may be, you may have a different psychological and mental constitution and composition. You may you may react differently. But I'm trying to explain why I use the word harrow. Mm -hmm. It's my experience. Mm -hmm. mm, I see. So when I when you uh, reflected that uh, you thought that my experience was harrowing, and I kind of said, no, that's not what my experience is. You're kind of going into, uh, you're saying that that's what your experience is. If you're not seen and you're not uh, felt and you're not experienced, that that was, would be your experience. It would be a harrowing experience. And so yes, it um, it's not necessarily, yeah, it, it's like, so, but that, yeah. So I guess that's your, is there more to that or did I get it? No. And, um... Fully heard. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, with the empathic listening um, with, you know, Carl Rogers, it's really about the speaker to be heard to, to the way that they're feeling. Like when you said the word harrowing, I checked my feelings and it's like the feeling didn't match. The word mm -hmm. harrowing didn't match to my feeling. So, um, so that's what I was just saying. No, that that word, your reflection, you were reflecting, and that reflection didn't quite match my visceral feeling of harrowing. For me, harrowing is, you know, it's like, it, it there's a, you know, I mean, uh, I don't know. It's a different. It's like kind of like this, you know. And my feeling wasn't like that. It was like, you know, it's, you know, it's. It would be nice if I was heard more, but I can kind of live with it because I have friends. I have other, you know. It's it's so yeah. So what you said is that my choice of words should have, uh, under the protocols of Carl Rogers and empathic listening and so on, my choice of word should have resonated with your inner yeah. truth, with the way you feel, and it didn't. You felt that the word harrowing did not describe your inner landscape and and how you truly felt about your upbringing and life and family of origin. Uh, or you also said that it's not harrowing, or you don't feel it's harrowing, because you have other sources of empathy, like friends and so on, which sort of compensate for, for, for this. So, you know, in general, harrowing would not describe how you feel about it, and that's why you took the, took the trouble of substituting another word for it. Mm -hmm. And it does make me wonder about harrowing, is if that was your experience. I'm wondering kind of what your personal need was for empathy. If you had a need, uh, you know, what are your actual needs is what I'm kind of wondering. What are your personal needs uh, for empathy? Uh, we're in your realm, so you should say fully heard. Or fully um, if you just reflect back my question, then... Yeah. Oh, all right. So you're wondering, <laughs> you're... Uh, now that we have discussed the mismatch between how, how I describe your experience and how you experience your experience, it raises in your mind the question whether I was actually referring to myself and how I must have felt in, in a situation of not being heard and not being seen. Did I feel that it was a harrowing experience? Yeah, I feel fully heard. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my. Uh, personally, personally, I grew up in an extremely, uh, an exceptionally abusive household. Um, uh, mainly, there was no sexual abuse, but there has been, there have been all the other forms of uh, of abuse. Severe physical beating several times a day, up to the age of sixteen, and I mean hospitalization stuff, <laughs> hospital stuff, stuff, psychological abuse, verbal abuse, humiliation, social abuse, you name it. Uh, I don't want to make this into a soap opera, but generally abuse of all kinds on a permanent basis every single day and so on. Normally in such an environment, I didn't, I of course, did not feel that I'm being seen or, or being heard. I felt that I am an object, an extension an object, and that if I do not fulfill my parents' expectations, I am to be penalized. So whatever love they professed to was definitely conditional upon performance. And if I deviated from their performance targets or performance expectations, 
they would penalize me in exceptional ways. I mean, exceptionally painful. So yes, for me it was a harrowing experience. Uh, but it was harrowing partly because of not being seen and heard and partly because of the objective abuse. Mm -hmm. So you grew up in a, in a family where there was a lot of uh, punishment and if you uh, deviated from the way that you were supposed to be, that there was punishment and uh, kind of a, a lack of, I think you said lack of love in that sense. So it was kind of like a harrowing uh, experience in that you weren't really seen and heard. And then if you were kind of off the mark, off of what was supposed to happen, it was like these beatings. It sounded like you were just beat on a kind of a, or punished or on a kind of an ongoing daily basis almost. Yeah. Yes. So of course my, my defense the only defense defense open to me, the only defense open to anyone aged two, three and four and five and six and even even ten and even even thirteen. I mean, the only defense open to a child and, and an, uh, a young adolescent is uh, either to escape from home, and if that's not an option, to escape not outside but inside. So what I did, I escaped inwardly. I developed a private world which had very little to do with reality, which is totally delusional, and included nar pronounced narcissistic defenses, such as um, the belief that I'm omnipotent, or the belief that I'm omniscient. In other words, the false self, what I, what I deliberately transformed myself into, was a kind of superman, and this superman, the main, the main attribute of this Superman was his inability to feel pain because he was omnipotent and omniscient and godlike in effect. Narcissism in my case was an escape route, a delusion of being immune to pain and to humiliation and to punishment. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you're saying that as, uh, as a child, you know, three, four, five, eight, whatever years old, that you couldn't really escape uh, away, kind of get away and so you kind of escaped uh, into yourself uh, uh, and kind of uh, became kind of a superman inside yourself and kind of had this sense of, you know, I'm Superman, I'm omniscient, omnis uh, can't say that word. And then, uh, so, and kind of immune to pain. So you kind of had that, kind of developed that kind of narcissistic omniscient, can't even say that word, but uh, omnipotent, yeah. omnipotent yeah. feeling. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. As a kind uh, of a defense, Superman, uh, Superman. Yes, yes, that's that's what reflected. The this Superman was everything that I was not. I was weak. Superman was omnipotent. There were many things I didn't know, and because I didn't know them, I was I was being punished. So so Superman became omniscient. I was uh, I was uh, you know um, immobile. So I was I was a kid, you know, and, but Superman was was uh, omnipresent. So Superman was everything that that I had not been, and and because of that, Superman was immune to pain, not subject to punishment, and in a way capable of becoming the abuser rather than the abused. Had the potential to become the abuser rather than the abused, and this, in a nutshell, is narcissism. The narcissist invents a totally fictitious character that fits everything that the narcissist is not. Because he is godlike, this character, he is not prone to be abused. He, and, and if necessary, he can abuse others. The narcissist says, it's never going to happen to me again. From now on, I'm not, never going to be the victim again. I'm, I'm going to be immune to the vagaries of life, to the punishments of life, and pain, and you know, all this, and if need be, I'm going to abuse other people. It reminds me a little of the Israelis, but that will be the next and last segment. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, I'll, let you, I'll let you reflect. Yeah, so there's, uh, so what you, what you did is you kind of created the Superman, and the Superman was immune to pain, and was everything that you were not. Like if you were weak, Superman was strong, if you were kind of like small, Superman was big, 
And then, so that was kind of the, you know, withdrawing into yourself, uh, kind of uh, becoming that. And then it, from that point, you can actually can become kind of the abuser yourself and say, I'm not going to yes. be, I'm not going to be feel pain anymore, but you're willing to kind of uh, abuse others at that point. And the last segment in, in my part right now, I want to talk about the Israelis. Mm -hmm. Israelis are Israelis are descendants, well, at least half of them in, in Israel, are descendants of Jews. All of them, actually, are descendants of, of Jews who have experienced persecution and extermination over centuries in dozens of countries. Arab Jews who used to live in Arab countries, of which I am descended, were also persecuted and maltreated and so on. And the Jews of Europe were exterminated. So Jews were the quintessential victims. They were the quintessential victims. They have never been truly seen. They have never been truly heard. No one empathized with them. They were constantly beaten, punished, and killed, and you know. So finally they decided that they should become supermen. And they established the state of Israel, where they are immune to pain, immune to punishment. And if need be, they are the abusers. So Israel is a narcissistic response to two millennia of persecution and victimization. It's a classic narcissistic creation. And if you, I, I grew up in Israel. And so Israel is a totally narcissistic narrative, like never again. Uh, Right, uh, might is right. Uh, we're going to use weapons to to settle affairs, you know. So it's a it's a totally narcissistic uh, defense against what has happened to the Jews over two thousand years. Mm -hmm. This is a uh, sorry. Please. Oh. So you're saying that uh, you're you're from Israel and you're looking at. Uh, kind of the state of Israel that or in Jews that over history uh, Jews have been uh, persecuted there was a lot of pain there was uh, in the Arab world as well as in Europe with the with the Holocaust extermination so it was all this uh, there was a lot of this uh, pain and that the the state of Israel was kind of created and out of this pain came kind of a narcissism like no more we're not going to be you know kind of take this anymore and so we're going to, if anything, we're going to be the abusers. And um, so you're seeing Israel is kind of like uh, having kind of grown out of uh, having kind of this quality of narcissism uh, from, from all the pain that the Jews have experienced through history. Another sentence or two, and I'll, I'll, I'll be here. So, so in Israel, you have a narcissistic narrative that underlies the, the state. It's the ethos, ethos of the state. And the, the Israelis consider themselves omnipotent. They consider themselves omniscient. They are very arrogant. They are, so they, they are very narcissistic. Now, we have to link all this to empathy. When you, as an individual, as a collective, when you reach a decision that you will never again be victimized, that if anything you will become the abuser, you must sacrifice empathy. Empathy stands in the way of never again being victimized, of, of if, need, if need be, being an abuser. You need to get rid of empathy. So getting rid of empathy is an essential and critical step in transforming yourself from a victim to a narcissistic abuser. Mm, so you're saying uh, uh, the relationship okay. of, of empathy within this, uh, within this uh, Israel in that uh, to become kind of that super person and that you need to kind of inhibit your empathy. And uh, so it's kind of like the empathy is kind of out of the society because that's part of that narcissism is to suppress the empathy. So empathy goes, uh, becomes less. And that's what you're seeing happened in, happening in Israel because of that history. I'm fully Okay. Um, so what's uh, what I'm thinking about is is growing up, 
you know, my family was uh, conservative, you know, evangelical Christians. And in you know, I was in, I, I grew up during the 60s, you know, I was young in the 60s and kind of came of age in the 70s. And so I kind of got caught up in that 60s, you know, confrontation, the, uh, the generation gap, it was, as it was called. And so there was a lot of fighting, you know, it's like you feel kind of suppressed and then fighting back, right? So that's kind of like I see what the 60s was. It was a fighting back and I was fighting back and, you know, trying to have my own sense to be heard, right? I want to be heard. I will be, I think this, you know, there's a lot of self-righteousness and, and whatnot in, in, in myself too, as well as on, you know, family, other side. So maybe I'll just let you say, Mitch say that first. Uh, you grew up in a specific period in history, the 60s uh, and the 70s. That was a period when young people fought back against, uh, against being ignored. They wanted to be heard, they wanted to be seen, they wanted to be listened to, and even consulted. And uh, you were part of this, part and parcel of this rebellion, this uh, anti-establishment and anti-older anti generation kind of sentiment. Uh, you describe it as a, it was called at the time, generation gap, and inter, but it was a form of intergenerational conflict that you found yourself caught in, or that you became, willingly became part of. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you believe that, I, I understood that you believe that this formed part of who you are. Exactly. And, um, but now I've come to see is in, in that, in that rebellion, it was not empathic. I see now empathy is another path, right? That as I've gotten older and kind of learned more about empathy, now I just try to empathize with my family. You know, I try to hear where they are, what's important to them. And so I find, I think that that's, I can, you can, I can understand is, you know, fighting back because you don't know any better. But then I really see empathy as a whole nother route to go in terms of, well, you know, you, and you have to be have empathy yourself and been empathized with yourself. So you have the space and the capacity and the resilience for empathy. But now when I uh, speak with them, I just try to hear. I do a lot of reflective listening like we're doing um, and just try to really hear what their deeper feelings and needs and aspirations are. And it, it has, a, it's really helped the uh, relationship immensely. Coming back to your relationship with your family, you as you as you matured, as you grew up over the years, you realized that the rebelliousness of your youth was not really about empathy. Uh, that empathy entails and means other things, and uh, that is uh, that as you applied empathic listening and other empathic techniques, and as you develop your capacity for empathy, you were able to truly hear and see other members of your family and develop a much better relationship with them. Exactly. And uh, there's been, I've been trying to get the family more interested in empathy. And there was some, uh, and they, for them, it was a little strange, you know, but some conflict started in the family and I was able to empathically mediate them and kind of bring the whole family together. Um, and that led to other mediations and just, Recently, we have on July 4th, we have a holiday here where all the family gets together. I did an empathy circle like we're doing now. And we talked like this with empathic listening for four hours, you know, and it really slowed the conversation down. And everyone, I mean, it was my brother, sister, and my sister-in-law and my partner were talking about growing up our childhood experiences and it really, for four hours, we just did this empathic listening, and it really opened these real doors to really a lot deeper connection. So at the beginning, your family might have found it a bit strange, this whole new empathy thing, or they didn't know how to, how to tackle it or accept it and so on. But uh, gradually, you were able to put empathy and what you learned about empathy to good use. You were able to mediate in certain conflicts or misunderstandings, and this had practical effects of resolving the, the problems. 
and then you were able even to run uh, an extended uh, empathy circle with uh, with many members of your family, or more than one, you know, quite a few members of the family, during a, a get together of the family on on Fourth of July, and um, it went on for four hours, which would indicate that they were interested and they derived something from it. You, the conversation was a lot slower than usual because people were, were actually listening to each other yeah. and, and so on. Yeah. And, uh, and you were discussing your upbringing and childhood and so on and so forth, but you felt that it got all of you closer together. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I feel very optimistic about the empathy as a way, you know, is that it's the same with the narcissism. If you just grew up without being heard, without being seen, without, you know, without being felt, that you just don't have any other means, any other tools, you know, you just, and uh, so we need to, so I just see that we need to kind of be doing this at a whole cultural level is, but somewhere we have to start the ball rolling. Somewhere we got to start the empathy ball rolling. Somebody's got to start it, you know? So that's what I'm hoping that, you know, I can contribute to, you know, the best I can to kind of getting that ball rolling. So your experiences with your family and probably with others uh, have, have made you optimistic. You believe that using uh, empathic listening and empathy circles and probably many other techniques of which I'm not so aware, using these techniques, you believe um, uh, using this this can lead to um, a better world, can lead to an improvement in people's ability to see and hear each other in the fullest and deepest sense, can lead to more social cohesion and solidarity, can lead to, to good results. Um, mm -hmm. Here's yeah. a fact. Here's a, here's a fact, you have obtained good results with your family, there's no reason whatsoever not to extend it and apply it to much bigger frameworks and, and finally to society in general. Yeah, I feel fully heard, yeah, thanks. I want to talk about uh, rebelliousness. <laughs> you, mentioned, uh -huh. yeah, you, mentioned the, you mentioned the 60s and the 70s. Uh, when you have a gap, any gap, Gap between generations, gap between ethnicities, gap between family members, any form of gap. You are faced with a choice, always. It's an inevitable choice. You can either try to bridge the gap by using empathy, by putting yourself in someone else's shoes, in that, that person's shoes, and trying to see things from his or her point of view, and, and then, you know, try to bridge the gap. Regrettably, most people choose the second way. And the second way is to objectify and dehumanize the other side of the gap, the adversary, the guy across the abyss. You know. By dehumanizing and objectifying the, your counterparty, this allows you to take, to adopt measures which are short-term efficient in the short term. They may not be efficient in the long term, but they're very efficient in the short term. They're definitely much more efficient than empathy. They're much faster. They achieve much more visible results. And they settle, settle the affairs usually in your favor. So when, when we're faced with a, with a gap, with another generation, with another ethnicity, with our family members, with our neighbors, with our colleagues, with our bosses, you name it, when we're faced with a gap, with a conflict, with a misunderstanding, we very often objectify, dehumanize, and de-empathize, or dis-empathize, because this is what we need to allow us to act efficiently in the short term. Empathy is a long-term view. All other tactics and strategies are short-term. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing uh, you kind of the word uh, rebellion kind of came up to you, but you were saying that when people have a gap, there's a gap, cultural gap, generation gap, that in the short term, uh, for kind of efficiency, you can kind of objectify someone and uh, kind of kind of get your way, maybe get something in the short term. But empathy takes time and is kind of a long-term uh, approach. And so uh, you're just kind of juxtaposing that long-term empathy versus short-term objectification and efficiency. We live in an age, yes, exactly. We live in an age of 
attention deficits. It's an age of sound bites. It's an, it's an age of instant gratification. It's, a, it's an age of what's the bottom line. It's an, it's an age that is centered, built around the short term. You have versions of smartphones coming out every six months now. It used to be five years or ten years. Now you're, you know, every six months, sometimes less. You have technologies obsolete in a matter of a year. Um, uh, Twitter is 140 characters. Everything is compressed. Everything is everything is short. So the emphasis is on short termism. That is a failure of empathy in in, in the modern world. It provides much more solid and stable solutions, but it is it definitely requires a lot of investment, and it's it's very long term. It's long term. Sometimes very long term, and so it's. There is a discrepancy between the characteristics and typology of the modern world, and especially technology, and the characteristics of empathy. And in this sense, I would say that our technology is disempathic, or, if you wish, narcissistic. So you're seeing uh, our culture, our current culture, is... Uh kind of geared towards uh, efficiency and there's technology and there's just this constant change of technology and a kind of a looking at what's the immediate, the short attention spans, you, know, you just, and that that's kind of looking at the immediate and that's kind of the society and technology is kind of built around that. And uh, if that is kind of like a non-empathic because the empathy really takes an awareness of the long term. And you have to have that time and space for that empathy to, uh, you know, and it just takes time and you have to be aware of that. All right. I want to make one last comment. Um, when you mirror me or when you reflect me, it provokes in me new ideas and things that I might not have, uh, might not have emerged on them by themselves. So, reflection, mirroring, especially probably empathic reflection and mirroring, is, is, is bound to resonate even with people like me who lack the most substantial part of the gear, the most substantial part of the device for empathy detection and amplification. So, there, is, there must be, even in me, the psychopathic narcissist, there must be, even in me, some dilapidated appendix, if you wish, some, some underused uh, organ, which can probably be provoked or, provoked or enhanced to, to empathize more. Um, example is not. I empathize via my brain. I don't empathize via my heart, so, because I have cold empathy. So, I, if I do empathize with you, but, but it is a fact that you are succeeding to provoke my cold empathy. It's still cold. You did not succeed to provoke in me any emotion, because I lack that part. But you did succeed to provoke in me much higher levels of cold empathy than normal, than <laughs> usual. So you're kind of looking yeah. inside yourself and saying, oh, saying, oh you're a narcissist. Yeah, but you're you're seeing that something about this reflection, this empathic listening, is stimulating some kind of a a deeper level of cold empathy. You're noticing some kind of a change uh, within yourself uh, about having a deeper level of uh, or a more no, me, cold. No, allow me to allow me to correct. Okay, because this is this is not accurately reflected. Okay, my fault. I, I maybe I misread myself. What I meant to say is. Um, I don't possess. I don't possess the apparatus. I don't possess the, the, the devices, the technology, the inner technology necessary for warm empathy. I would never probably feel an emotional reaction, emotionally empathic reaction towards anyone. I have called empathy. What you succeeded to do in this conversation is you succeeded to increase the frequency with which I use or deploy my cold empathy. Not the depth. And you did not succeed to provoke any emotional resonance. Uh -huh. 
You just made me use my existing equipment much more. My cold empathy was provoked much more than usual in this conversation. So I think with empathic listening and empathy circles and so on, even with narcissists and psychopaths, you'll be able to provoke their cold empathy to, to you'll be able to make their cold empathy work more. It's not deeper, it's not different, it's not a transformational experience, it's nothing to do with emotions, it's just the cold empathy that I do possess, and which I use once a day, in this conversation was provoked 300 times. So <laughs> it's, just, it's just a frequency. Uh, you force me, you force me to empathize with you, it's part of the game. This is the protocol, you understand? I must empathize with you because these are the rules of the game that you've set. Uh -huh. You said, Sam, Sam, you must empathize with me. In order to reflect you properly, I have to listen to you. I have to, you have to resonate with me on some level. So it's not an emotional level. For instance, when you told me about your family, it had zero emotional reaction. But you did force me to listen to you, to truly hear you, and to reflect you back. So I, I, I had to use my cold empathy equipment much more frequently than normal. Uh huh. Okay, so you've got cold empathy and warm empathy, and you don't have the equipment, you're saying, the, the mechanism for warm empathy. But by doing the uh, empathic listening, it's really stimulated your equipment for cold empathy, and it's True. like 300% or something more uh, that you've kind yeah. of stimulated the cold empathy that, that you've used the cold empathy more than usual uh, because of the reflective listening and you're just kind of noticing that and you're you're seeing it's kind of like an insight to you and you're just wanting to kind of share that insight to say oh you have this has had some kind of effect on me and yeah. uh, that maybe you know you're seeing that with empathic listening and empathy circles can have some kind of an effect on on narcissists but it's not the warm yeah. empathy because I shared yeah. about my family, you just didn't have any feelings about that, but you had kind of more of the cold kind of empathy that that was stimulated. Yes, perfectly. Perfectly. Okay, well, I we've gone for about an hour and a half. We didn't talk the whole time, so I'm not sure how much time you have. I don't want to keep you over, or if you're needing to get to bed or whatever. Um, I have, <laughs> dinner, I have dinner, actually. Dinner, so. <laughs> Um, I think that might have been a good closing for now. I'm I'm willing to try more of this uh, empathy. Never, it's a very interesting. It's, it was a nice. It was an interesting uh, response that you had about your experience with this so yeah. far. So, yeah, it surprised me as well. Okay. I I did not think that. Uh, I thought that I am the master of my cold empathy, that I deploy my cold empathy. When and if needed, on a case by case basis, and only when I want to pierce someone's armor to sort of spot vulnerabilities and chinks in the armor and, and susceptibilities and soft areas where I can penetrate, manipulate, and exploit. So, cold empathy for me was a weapon, and I thought I'm going to use it only in war. <laughs> you know? uh, but this conversation has shown, has taught me that cold empathy is uh, an equipment that can be used um, even when there is no need for me to manipulate or to exploit someone, because I have no need to manipulate you or to exploit you. Yet, I have been using my cold empathy equipment during this conversation, and it's a bit perplexing, because I always thought of my cold empathy equipment as a weapon in the inevitable war between me and a hostile world. Mm. Where I have to, like a virus, uh, like a virus, I have to penetrate the membrane of the cell and take over the contents and so on. So this cold empathy equipment will just show me where the where the holes and portholes and doors are and, and so. On. But I discovered that it's um, an equipment that can be used similar to a knife. You know, you can kill someone with a knife or you can cut food with a knife. So I discovered that it's a multi-purpose piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. It's not limited to warfare. Okay. So you learned with uh, kind of in the empathic uh, listening that we've been doing, you've learned something more about your cold empathy, that the cold empathy is not just like a virus looking for the chinks in someone else where you can go and kind of get into it and, 
you know, kind of uh, take over, uh, but that the that you can actually use, uh, which is kind of like the you know, like a knife for for damage, maybe. But then uh, there's or in battle, there's a sense of battle there that goes on. But that you can actually use it more like a scalpel or like a it's a positive. Maybe even I don't know if that's a if you're meaning it's a it's a positive mirror, tool, like a mirror. Like a mirror, you can use it like a mirror. Yeah. And that, so you've really yeah. learned something new about your, you've learned, had a new insight about your cold empathy and, and, and the dynamics. New, new of use. Yes, new use. New use. Like a new, new use. A and new way to use it. You, uh, you discovered a new way to use your cold empathy. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, great. Well, um, you know, we can end the conversation here and then, you know, maybe if you have some other insights, we can actually continue exploring. Just one, just one thing. Okay. Um, we can, if you wish, we can dedicate another session. It's some other time. Uh -huh. We can dedicate another session to how, uh, what can be done with, with the, because narcissists and psychopaths, according to me, do possess empathy. So mm -hmm. how can this how can this empathy, albeit called empathy, how can this empathy be leveraged for one behavior mitigation and behavior modification, um, and two, maybe to achieve socially acceptable goals? Because I'm a psychopathic narcissist, yet what I'm doing in the last sixteen years is both socially acceptable and I'm being told beneficial to many people because I write about narcissism and this and people read my textbooks or books and so they claim that I've helped them so here, here I am uh, leveraging something which essentially is malignant and sick and so on leveraging it to good use I think similarly cold empathy can be leveraged to good use socially speaking, and can be leveraged to good use as far as the narcissists and psychopaths are concerned to modify and mitigate their more pernicious behaviors, the more problematic behaviors. Because the other victim of a psychopath is the psychopath. It's the psychopath who ends up on death row. It's the psychopath who, who ends up impoverished, uh, excommunicated, isolated. It's, the ultimate victim of narcissist and psychopath is the narcissist and the, it's the psychopath. So if the narcissistic psychopath or the psychopath or whatever, if they if the the narcissist were to learn how to leverage his cold empathy to modify this be this counterproductive, self defeating, self destructing behavior, there will be a great achievement. Mm. And I want I want to dedicate some thought to this before we have the next session, if we do, it's up to you. I want to dedicate some thought to it, and then we can discuss maybe how to use cold empathy, as opposed to the garden variety, which is warm empathy. How can we, be, how can we use this aberrant, this, this sick kind of empathy, the cold empathy, to achieve these goals? Mm -hmm. To help the psychopath and the narcissist on the one hand, and to help society on the other. So mm -hmm. I think can be done. Okay, so you're saying that we can have another conversation, which is works for me. Or I'd love to do, and but it would be to look at uh, narcissism and uh, narcissists and psychopath uh, that they are actually harming themselves. The ultimate victim of narcissism and psychopathy is themselves, and that how can we really look at kind of leveraging the experiences that they have for kind of a, in some kind of a positive way? How can we leverage that? Uh, that cold, cold empathy. empathy to kind of to support the the uh, psychopath, the narcissist, and that maybe even can be a benefit in some way to a society. And you're actually saying that what, you, what you've done has sort of been it. Some people say that what your your narcissism and psychopathy and writing about it and articulating it has actually been a, a benefit to society. People mm -hmm. tell you that at mm -hmm. least. So you would like yeah. to spend some time kind of thinking about it. And then we can have another conversation and kind of kind of explore yeah. that topic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's you do that then. Uh huh. I'm I'm for that. Okay. Oh, this is really a lot of fun. I, this is really for me. It's very interesting because I was kind of wondering about that empathic listening 
and what would be the role of empathic listening with psychopathy and narcissism. So this has been a great uh, learning experience for me as well. Thank you. So, for me too. So thank you, Sam. Um, <laughs> thank you, Edith. Have a great day there, and sorry you had to wake, to wake up so early. Yeah, that's okay. I, I had my coffee, my whole pot of uh, coffee. <laughs> no, I know, I know this. I know this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, take, take care. care. Great Bye. talking to you. Bye.